The mere fact that this is what we have to discuss and what has become a point of discussion, meaning that it's not really clear why he's there, is a strong indication as to why there's some question marks about the wisdom of this trip altogether. That's the voice of Trita Parsi, the Executive Vice President at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plasters Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now here are your co-hosts, Tom Kalina and Lauren Billet. Thanks, Angela, and welcome back to Press the Button. Hello, Mr. Tom Kalina. How are you doing? Lauren, great to see you. I'm fine. Thank you very much. But I have sad news to deliver. Over the weekend, we learned of the passing of Michael Crapon, co-founder of the Stimson Center and a tireless advocate for international peace and security. He passed away at his home in Charlottesville, Virginia. I count myself as fortunate as someone to have known him personally for many years. He leaves a wonderful legacy and will be sorely missed in our thoughts are with his family. That was very nice of you to share, Tom. I did not know him, but my thoughts are with his family as well and very grateful for the work that he did for our community. But speaking of our community, Tom, nuclear news, what do you have for us? Yes, lots of news to share. President Biden concluded his first presidential trip to the Middle East on Saturday, where he visited Israel and Saudi Arabia over the period of a few days. His trip seemed to be about a lot of things to a lot of different people. The U.S. role in the region, the Iran nuclear deal, oil, U.S. gas prices, and so much more. During the first leg of his trip, Biden repeatedly vowed to ensure that Iran would not acquire a nuclear weapon. And he added that he would consider using force against Iran as a last resort. Biden maintains that he believes diplomacy remains the best avenue to keep Tehran from obtaining a bomb. But as Emma Belcher and I wrote last week in Defense One, the Iran deal talks, the main uh, alternative which diplomacy might take, is drifting to failure, making future military action all the more likely. So we're afraid the time is running out for the Iran nuclear deal. Biden reassured his allies that the U.S. remains committed to the Middle East. He pledged to say actively engaged in response to concerns that China and Russia could fill the leadership vacuum in the region if the United States were to withdraw. And then Biden went to Saudi Arabia, where his decision to greet the crown prince Mohammed bin Salman, known as MBS, with a fist bump has sparked outrage due to concern the crown prince uh, played a role in the murder of Saudi American journalist Jamal Khashoggi. And Biden reportedly felt that he had to visit Saudi Arabia to ask the oil-rich nation to increase its production to help global oil prices come down and thus reduce U.S. gas prices here before the fall elections. In response to Biden's visit to the region, Iran accused the United States of inciting tensions in the region through Iranophobia, a new phrase they're using. And we will have more on Biden's trip later in the show when I speak with Trita Parsi. He's the executive vice president at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. It's a great conversation across all of these fronts, so please stay tuned for that. And Lauren, what do you have lined up for early warning? This week, Angela Kellett sat down with Dr. Cheryl Harrison, an assistant professor in the Department of Oceanography and Coastal Sciences at Louisiana State University. She led an international team of researchers in producing a paper focused on the impact that nuclear weapons have on the climate. It's an incredibly fascinating paper and conversation, so stay tuned. And if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Your feedback helps us to improve the show. And with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning, early warning, early warning, early warning, a seven minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Jacqueline. How would the use of nuclear weapons affect our world, its environment, and in turn, all of us? This is the core question of a study conducted by an international team of researchers led by Dr. Cheryl Harrison at LSU. The team of researchers ran multiple computer stimulations to study the impacts of regional and larger scale nuclear warfare on the Earth's systems given today's nuclear warfare capabilities. Today, we're joined by Dr. Harrison herself to tell us more about this paper. First of all, congratulations to you and your team on this paper. 
Can you please tell us about the study's core findings? Thank you, Angela. So we simulated six different wars, five India-Pakistan nuclear wars with varying arsenal sizes and a U.S.-Russia war. That is kind of a historical simulation that we've done before to see how it changed in modern climate models. And it didn't change. It, the message was the same. It's important to note first that whether it's India and Pakistan or NATO and Russia, once the smoke gets into the upper atmosphere, it has the same impact. And this is very similar to what's happened after historical volcanic eruptions. The earth cools, it gets dark, um, the precipitation gets lower, so it doesn't rain as much. And this leads on land to widespread famine. Um, ocean, it hasn't been looked at what happened, so we were looking at the ocean. And what we found was that the ocean responded on two timescales, um, a short time scale during the initial cooling event when there's a lot of smoke in the atmosphere, and then a much longer time scale from decades to hundreds to even thousands of years, depending on what part of the ocean system you look at. On the short time scale, the, some of the really interesting effects are that we see an expansion of sea ice into major ports such as Copenhagen, St. Petersburg, Tianjin, and down into Shanghai on the Chinese coast. And these are places where people don't have icebreakers. And so in a world where there's already food shortages, that would further impact the ability for ships to come in to bring supplies. In the ocean ecosystems, we found that the reduced light and cold temperatures led to a massive decline in that primary productivity, especially at high latitudes that would impact fisheries and marine ecosystems and very likely lead to widespread die-offs. It's important to note that these simulations of nuclear war have similar effects to historical and paleoclimate records of volcanic simulations. So when we're thinking about how to design our society, how to have food resilience and resilient ecosystems, that we think about the possibility of these happening and that they're definitely going to happen for volcanic eruptions. However, we really need to not do this for nuclear weapons. It's just not the, the consequences to ourselves, to civilization and to um, and to marine ecosystems and other and, and land based ecosystems are just horrendous. So there's a lot to learn from your work. If you had to describe the importance of the study in a single sentence to our listeners, what would you say? The main thing I would say is that nuclear war, even small nuclear wars, would likely change the Earth system for a really long time. And so then the question is, why do we have weapons that can have such a large climate impact? Maybe we should just use conventional weapons instead and, and get rid of these because it's it's just too dangerous. So what were your personal takeaways from the research? Simply that nuclear weapons are really dangerous. From a scientific perspective, it's really interesting how the Earth system responds to these types of perturbations. And so we learned a lot of things that we're bringing into some of the other studies we're doing. For example, we're simulating the asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs. And it's using the same model code base. So we expect that it will be very similar effects, but just a much higher degree. Finally, where can listeners read your research as well as where can they learn more about this topic? So the research is out on AGU Advances and it's open access, so anybody can read it. To learn more about this topic, my colleague Alan Robach, who I'm sure people in this sphere know well, has a great website full of lots of things and um, including links to all of our research. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, Dr. Harrison. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Angela. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Shing, the Communications and Marketing Specialist at Plowshares Fund. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has exposed just how close nuclear escalation and nuclear war can be. To meet the urgency of this moment, Plowshares Fund has launched a donation match challenge to make the largest grants possible to those who are working every day to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons. Right now, all first-time gifts will be matched dollar for dollar, and all new monthly gifts will be matched at their 12-month value. Or, increase your giving and the full amount above your last gift will be matched. Go to plowshares.org slash donate today. And thanks for listening. Joe Biden made his first trip to the Middle East as president last week. 
and he covered a lot of ground. In particular, he talked with leaders in Israel about the Iran nuclear deal, where President Biden said he was still committed to diplomacy to stop an Iranian bomb, but was willing to use force, quote, as a last resort. Biden also traveled to Saudi Arabia, where oil and gas prices were on the minds of many. To help us understand what the trip was really intended to achieve, we're joined by Trita Parsi, Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute. Trita, so great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. So Trita, there's been a lot of speculation about what this trip is really about, a lot of different agendas floating around. Give us your sense. What is the purpose of Biden's trip? Why did he meet with Israel and Saudi Arabia? And why now? Thank you so much, Tom. And let me start off by saying the mere fact that this is what we have to discuss and what has become a point of discussion, meaning that it's not really clear why he's there, is a strong indication as to why there's some question marks about the wisdom of this trip altogether. I'm all in favor of diplomacy, but diplomacy has to be done the right way, uh, given the right things, get the right things in return, and an escalation or, or a climaxing of a presidential trip should not come easily. It should come at the, the right moment with the right things. We've heard a lot about it being in regards to oil, and I think clearly oil is one element there. I do not believe it's the driving force because the math just doesn't add up. What the Saudis can do in terms of oil right now is very limited. Even when we talk about their spare capacity, their ability to go to the top of their spare capacity for a long period of time, or actually for weeks, does not exist. We just had on one of our webinars at Quincy, Paul Pilar, Paul Pilar who uh, spoke about this issue and pointed out but they never really been at 12.5 million barrels a day for more than a few days. And even when it comes to lower that 11 and a half, I believe he said, it only lasted about eight weeks. So really what the Saudis can do in this regard is very, very limited. If oil really was the issue, Biden would have been better off to go back into the Iran nuclear deal, freeing up all of the Iranian capacity, as well as the immediate injection of roughly 85 million barrels of oil that the Iranians have already pumped out, but have not been able to sell because of US sanctions. They're sitting uh, on tankers on the sea and elsewhere inside of Iran. So I don't believe that oil is, you know, there's this narrative that the reason why we are sacrificing our values here is because of irresistible geopolitical imperatives. Those geopolitical imperatives are actually not there. If this was the imperative, there were better things that Biden could have done. The other thing is a desire to get the Saudis and the Emiratis and others to be more closely tied to the United States, making sure they're not shifting towards China, certainly not shifting or being too cozy with Putin right now, given what Putin is doing in Ukraine. But there too, it's in my view, it's not that that is not necessarily a desirable goal. It's the question mark of, are you really capable of achieving such reorientation on the part of Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, given the fact that what they're asking of you is something that you very unlikely can offer them, which is they want written security guarantees. They want to have a defense pact with the United States that will endure and um, uh, last longer than just one presidency. This would mean that the United States would send U.S. military servicemen and women to Saudi Arabia to defend that country in case of a war. At a time when the overwhelming majority of Americans want to bring troops home from the United States, it's really questionable that there's much wisdom in Biden offering this, or even if he can offer it, given that this would most likely require some form of congressional approval. That leaves us then with the third factor, which I think is the more important one, which is this is about, on the one hand, rebuilding relations with Israel, uh, given the tremendous damage that Bibi Netanyahu did to the relationship between the Israeli government and the Democratic Party. And in that context, something that the Israelis are pushing for very, very hard is pressure from the US on the Saudis for the Saudis to normalize relations with Israel 
expand on the Abrams Accord and move towards some form of an Israeli-Arab alliance in the Middle East uh, against Iran and its partners and allies. Essentially, a new form of block system in the Middle East that to a certain extent already is shaping up, but is not at that formal level and certainly is not at the level of having an explicit American endorsement. I want to get to the Israel-Arab connection in a second. But first, I want to touch on the Iran nuclear deal with you, which was something that Biden discussed while he was in Israel. And while there, Biden committed to diplomacy, that is, reviving the Iran nuclear deal. But he also said he'd use force if he had to to stop an Iranian bomb. So, Tritas, give us your sense. Do you think the Biden administration is doing all it can to get a deal to use diplomacy? And if not, what does that say about the likelihood of military conflict? I think that from the outset, the administration has been a bit of two minds on this issue. I don't doubt that there was a genuine desire to get the deal, but a desire to get the deal and the desire or willingness to pay the political cost for it are two different things. We experienced this during the Obama years as well. I thought Obama was fully committed to uh, diplomacy with Iran. It was actually part of his platform as candidate. And then after one year of attempting and it didn't work out, uh, he had to put it on the back burner. He knew that there were still opportunities, but it just cost too much. And it wasn't until he get into his second term in which the constellation of stars were more in favor of diplomacy, but also he was in a position to be able to spend some political capital. I don't think we have seen anywhere near that political determination on the side of the Biden administration. And to a certain extent, I think that is understandable. This is his first term. This is a president that came in and had to deal with a significant amount of problems, everything from the economy to COVID to tremendously deep divisions within the country. But I don't think that those concerns necessarily were the main ones. I think there was a strong sense in the administration, among some at least, that they simply wanted to avoid the headache that Obama had to deal with because he ended up on the opposite side of the Israeli prime minister at the time, Bibi Netanyahu, who also was the prime minister of Israel when Biden first came in. And a significant fear that if they went fast into the nuclear deal, just simply rejoined, for instance, by executive order, that this would then create significant tensions with Netanyahu, who would you know, cherish the opportunity to once again fight with a democratic president and further drive um, American politics into a position in which the Republican Party is seen as the pro-Israel party, uh, and, and create other problems for Biden's domestic agenda. And as a result, the first eight or nine weeks of this administration's uh, term was used to consult with the Israelis, the Saudis, and the Emiratis, the only three countries in the world that actually opposed the nuclear deal. And this had several negative consequences, many of which perhaps the administration did not foresee. First of all, um, it sent the Iranians the signal uh, that the United States was not seeking to come back into the deal fast, but rather wanted to renegotiate the deal, and that it wasn't really willing to make big compromises that would upset the Israeli. And if the idea is to renegotiate a return, and also we have to keep in mind the signal the administration or the message they sent to the Iranians uh, privately was to say that the U.S. will come back into the deal, but they want to have an upfront promise from the Iranians that they're going to immediately be willing to renegotiate the entire agreement. And that renegotiation, in my view, by the way, is not illegitimate in any way, shape, or form. Just several aspects of the deal that both sides could have a benefit from revisiting. But to make that an upfront request in the manner that the administration did, and its unwillingness to even, as a goodwill gesture, lift some of the sanctions that Trump had put in, left the Iranians with the impression that Biden was seeking to use Trump's sanctions leverage, its maximum pressure sanctions, uh, in order to force the Iranians into uh, a longer and stronger deal, as Tony Blinken put it. And the Iranians would be in a very bad position uh, because they had given up 
their main leverage. They had restarted aspects of their program, but they had given up the main leverage. And the end consequence of that was that the Iranians then started dramatically accelerating their nuclear program. I mean, some aspects of what the Iranians have done that is really problematic and has contributed tremendously to the shortening of Iran's breakout capability happened under Biden's watch, not under Trump's watch. A lot of bad things happen under Trump's watch as well, but 60% enriched uranium, that only happened under Biden's watch. And now we're dealing with a situation in which having chosen not to just go back into the deal through an executive order and renegotiate it, after 18 months of so far, unfortunately, failed negotiations, and there's plenty of blame to go on both sides on, on that failure. But we're actually in a situation in which the Iranians are closer to a nuclear capability than ever before. And the idea that we have more leverage now just doesn't ring true to my ears because the Iranians have actually expanded their program more and they arguably have more leverage. So the argument that I, I guess some in the White House would say that we couldn't have just gone back into the deal because we would have given up all of our sanctions leverage, but the Iranians still had done some things outside of the JCPOA that we had to push back. That is true. We had to push back on that. But would we have been better off if we had gone back in right away, even if we gave up these sanctions, given the fact that the things that we have to push back on back then would be far fewer than what we have to push back right now. I mean, they didn't have any 60% in which uranium, didn't have 45 or so kilos of that. So I think we would actually have been a stronger position of negotiation, also morally, just having gone back into the deal uh, would have put the US in a stronger moral position, and it would also regain the ability to use the snapback sanctions at the UN if diplomacy didn't really end up working. So I, I think from the outset, there was a uh, too careful of an approach that ended up having far worse consequences than I think the administration themselves envisioned. And of course, in all of this, one of the bad things that happened is that it's meant that this time frame delayed to the point in which uh, the Iranians had an election and elected a candidate who was much more hardline, and the Iranians elected a nuclear negotiator that was one of the strongest opponents of the JCPA uh, back in 2015. None of that was helpful. None of that at the same time, was unpredictable. Administration officials themselves were on the record saying uh, during the transition that the window to return to the JCPOA was a very, very short one, precisely because of the Iranian elections. Thank you for that background. Bring that story up to where we are now with Biden in the Middle East. Do you expect to see progress going forward in the next few months? I mean, how does this trip contribute or detract from that effort? And how do you see things playing out before the U.S. midterm elections? I have to say, I'm unfortunately very, very pessimistic uh, at this point. I think we have reached a point in which time in many ways actually have run out. So for instance, at the Doha round, one of the things the Iranians were asking for, they apparently dropped their demand for the US to lift the IRGC from the terrorist list, which I know the US side uh, strongly wanted, of course, and was hoping that that would mean a breakthrough. But then the Iranians had several other demands, one of which was that they wanted the wind down period for US sanctions to be such that instead of the standard of six months, which is current US law, it would be extended to two years, meaning that if something happened in the next two years, uh, those sanctions would actually not kick in until 2025 or, or by the time the next president came in. The reason this appears to have been demanded is not because of a mistrust necessarily that Biden himself would reimpose sanctions, but rather their concern that in the midterm elections, Republicans will take the House and the Senate and as a result be in a position to take away the waiver rights that the president is using to waive sanctions. Because at the end of the day, when we say lift sanctions, we're actually not lifting the sanctions, we're just waiving them. Some of the sanctions need to be waived every 90 days, some of them every 120 days, some of them 180 days. But there's still laws that are on the books. We, the president has just been given the right by Congress to waive them based on certain criteria and, and assertions or, or uh, assessment that the White House would make. If those waiver rights are taken away, the sanctions come back on automatically. And with the right amount of votes, a Republican Congress could do this. Even if it failed, however, 
the chilling effect it would send through the business community, knowing that Congress is actually trying to take away the waivers, would be sufficient to make sure that the wind down period of two years wouldn't matter anyways. And it would probably send most businesses out of the Iranian economy. The fact that this was requested leaves me with the impression, and, and this is why I'm more than anything else a bit pessimistic right now. It leaves me the, with the impression that if the Iranians were to come back in, they may do so out of desperation because of their economic situation, because of the many other problems that they are faced with, some of them, many of them uh, of their own making. This worries me for a simple reason. For a deal, particularly an arms control deal, to be durable, beyond the political stability that is needed on both sides, there also needs to be a sense that there's actually something really good for each side. I was not worried that the Iranians would be cheating on the JCPOA back in 2015, because I thought that they had themselves realized that this was a good deal for them. So it was better for them to abide by it than to cheat. This time around, with the fact that they're expecting a Republican takeover in the midterms, they're expecting a Republican president in 2025, uh, no effort by the Biden administration to ensure that there are mechanisms in place that at least would make it more difficult for a future president to do what Trump did. All of that combined, I think, has left them with an impression in which they don't think this deal is lasting. They don't think this lead deal is particularly good for them. They're giving up all of their leverage for temporary sanctions relief. Some of that sanctions relief being much more temporary than they first thought. They perhaps thought early on that it could at least last for the term of Biden, but now it may not even last longer than November of this year. So going back into the deal right now, if that were to happen, and I'm not saying it would necessarily be bad, I would still support it, but I am much, much more worried now that this is now become such an imbalanced deal that the risk of them cheating is far greater than it was before. The risk that already now they're doing something because we don't have the eyes of the IEA in place any longer because they've closed down so many of the cameras. Even the assessment of how much 60% enriched uranium they have is an assessment. It's not a measurement by the IEA at this point. Are they doing other things? I'm really worried about this. And, and this is where I think the culture in Washington, uh, I'm a bit out of sync of. I believe that good deals need to be good for both sides. Otherwise, they're not balanced and they're not durable. They're not going to endure and you're going to constantly have to worry. The best guarantee that neither side would cheat would be to make sure that both sides or all sides in this case felt that there was something really, really good for it, uh, in it for them. I'm not so sure that is the case any longer. So even with the return, I would still be much, much more worried than I was in 2015. Let's talk for a moment about what Biden seems to be doing by trying to bring Israel and Arab states closer together, something you mentioned at the top of the show, and which, which seems to be in the vein of carrying on the vision from the Trump administration and the Abram Accords. Tell us what you think is at stake here and where this effort is going. I see a lot of problems and challenges here, and I think it goes back to what we talked earlier on that the commitment to the JCPOA, or at least the vision of the JCPOA, is very different in this administration, the Obama administration, how odd that yet may sound. Obama clearly viewed this as the beginning of a new diplomatic effort. He signaled the Saudis that we're trying to solve our problems with Iran. We encourage you to do the same. There was hope that after the JCPOA, there would be diplomacy on other matters. In fact, Throughout the Syrian civil war, the diplomatic efforts that were conducted, the U.S., because of the existing containment policy of Iran, insisted that Iran could not be at the table at any one of those talks. As soon as the JCPOA was signed, the U.S. position shifted 180 degrees, and the U.S. was insisting that Iran needed to be at the table in order to be able to come to an agreement and an end to this horrible civil war. It was seen as a change in the trajectory of U.S.-Iran relations, but it needed to start off by first resolving the most problematic issue, which was the nuclear issue and the risk of war and the risk of a nuclear Iran that that brought about. But it was not the end of it. 
And in many ways, it was the beginning of a, a different approach in the Middle East. Uh, it was the end of Iran's containment. The, as I mentioned, Obama told the Saudis, you have to go towards diplomacy as well, instead of thinking it is just the same old as before. That does not seem to be the approach of the Biden administration. The, the Abrams Accord itself is the brainchild of Netanyahu and Kushner and others who uh, were in the Trump administration, whose view was that we cannot let the inability or the unwillingness to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian issues to stand in our way. Instead, we need to now create alliances, normalization between some Arab states and Israel, and simply go beyond the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Going beyond the Israeli-Palestinian conflict means uh, sweeping it under the rug, ignoring it. This was not the Obama approach at all. And I think this administration, the Biden administration has now, I mean, clearly with this trip, with this uh, uh, emphasis of seeking to, as they call it, further integrate Israel into the region, regardless of what the Israelis are doing in Palestinian territories, regardless of the continued occupation, regardless of the fact that so many human rights organizations have now come out and said that this meets the standard of apartheid. So regardless of all of this, put all of the emphasis on the integration of Israel with other Arab states, and as the Israelis themselves want, provide a military dimension to it, a dimension that right now at first perhaps will be manifested with efforts to create a common air defense, as they call it. All of this, in my view, is just a continuation of what we have done in the last 40 years, which is we have sought to organize the region against some entity, and for most of that period of time, it's been Iran, organizing the region in order to contain and isolate that country. It's a strategy that has been utterly unsuccessful and tremendously costly, part of the reason why Obama wanted to break out of it. And it, that's not to say that there are not very strong reasons to oppose a lot of what Iran has done. But what Iran has done that is wrong is not necessarily an automatic justification for a policy that for four decades has not worked. But here we see the administration going back into that pattern. It's now really emphasizing the Abrams support, that expansion, the entire trip, one of the big things is the fact that Biden could fly from Israel directly to Saudi Arabia for the first time, and that Saudi airspace is now going to be open for Israeli aircraft. All of this, in my view, is very difficult to square with a belief that we are doing everything we can to get the JCPOA and that the JCPOA afterwards can survive. Because the JCPOA, is an arms control agreement. It's closing off Iran's pathways to a nuclear weapon. It's essentially preemptive disarmament. How can we have preemptive disarmament on one side of the Persian Gulf while we are then organizing the rest of the Middle East and military alliance against Iran? To me, it sounds that if we do this, we may be able to miraculously get back to JCPOA. I just don't see how that will last, however, because we're tilting the balance in such a way uh, in which the Iranians clearly will see this as a threat. And if they're seeing it as a threat, their desire and demand for something to deter it with will actually increase rather than decrease. Let me ask you, given that, and, and this is our last question because um, we're running out of time, do you see it as consistent or not to try to revive the Iran deal at the same time as trying to bring Israel together with countries like Saudi Arabia? Or is their relationship, Israel, Saudi Arabia, other Arab states, required to have this conflictual relationship with Iran? I'm afraid that, unfortunately, the second option is more likely. In fact, if you take a look at Jared Kushner's own document that was leaked by Political last year, it makes it very clear that A, this arrangement necessitates a massive American investment to bring it about, and then massive American continued support. So this is tying the US to the Middle East more than uh, less, meaning it's not an exit out of the Middle East, it's actually further entrapping us. 
The other thing that is quite fascinating is actually what you said. In the document, under the rubric of challenges, it points to potential improved Saudi-Iranian relations as something that will challenge and complicate the ability to sustain the Abram support. Because at the end of the day, as it's been so clear in the media narrative about this, it's the threat of Iran, the perceived threat of Iran, that seems to have been a key driving force to bring these countries together. That threat perception needs to be sustained in order to sustain the alliance. This is one of the tricks that always exists with alliances, which is that it may be justified at one moment, but if you then build an entire structure around it, then you actually need the original threat perception to still be there to be able to continue to justify the alliance. 50 years ago, remarkably, the picture or the table were quite turned. Iran and Israel, we're having a close security relationship from the 50s uh, and onwards. And it was driven by a threat perception from the Soviet Union and strong Arab states, such as Iraq under uh, Saddam Hussein and Egypt under Nasser. But then in the early 1970s, the Iranians, the Shah, managed to create an opening with Sadat in Egypt and dramatically improved relations with the Egyptians. And this caused panic in Israel because they increasingly feared that if Iran no longer has those problems with the Arabs, it would diminish and undermine their very important alliance with Iran. And I interviewed an Iranian official who served under the Shah, a senior official who served under the Shah uh, for my dissertation about this. And he almost angrily responded and said, we didn't have Israel as a friend in order to have the Arabs as enemies. But what we're doing now with the Abrams Accord, I think, unfortunately, may be exactly that. That in order to be able to sustain uh, this opening, this integration, as the administration speaks of it, uh, between some Arab states and Israel, there actually needs to be a continuation of a threat perception from Iran. Uh, and that is what I fear instead of helping resolving tensions in the region, we may be helping cementing them. And that would be a huge mistake. And if I could just say one last thing, it's important to recognize that this was not the only option Biden had. It's not as if the geopolitical imperatives were such that he was forced to do this. I think we can all agree, Biden clearly doesn't want to go to Saudi Arabia. He's not happy being there. He did not want to do this. And I can understand that. But it's not so that geopolitical imperatives were such that he had no choice. He had choices. There's this other amazing initiative in the region taking place right now, where the Iraqi government has been hosting diplomacy, diplomatic meetings between the Iranians and the Saudis, between the Turks and the Egyptians, between the Saudis and the Qataris, Qataris and Emiratis. Then the Omanis and others have helped out and there's been conversations between the Iranians and the Egyptians and the Jordanians and the Iranians. And it's all been climaxing in what's called the Baghdad Dialogue. The difference between the Baghdad Dialogue and the Abrams Accord is quite strong. The Baghdad Dialogue is not organized against any one country. It's an open forum, inclusive, for the purpose of resolving tensions rather than cementing the region in various blocks that are destined to be fighting each other. Moreover, it's coming from inside the region itself. This is not yet another one of those issues or so-called solutions that have been cooked up in Washington and then imposed on the region from the outside. I don't understand why this was not more of an attractive option for Biden, particularly because this option, unlike Abrams Accord, would actually not require more American military resources. It would require less. It would actually enable the United States to reduce its military presence in the region rather than the other way. I wish you had taken that option instead. Trita, thank you so much for this tour of a region that remains one of the most confounding conflicts and areas for U.S. policy. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited in Washington, D.C. by Lauren Billett, Angela Kellett, and Alex Hall. Audio engineering in San Francisco by Jacqueline Shing. 
Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.